Welcome back. You're watching HFO TV. HFO TV is co sponsored by the construction, repair, and restoration firm J.R. Johnson, the real estate law firm Baljanic LLP, the tax deferral accommodator Butler Exchange Group, the mortgage banking firm Gantry Incorporated, and forensic building consultants providing building structural science services. Welcome back to HFO TV. I'm Greg Frick, partner at HFO Investment Real Estate. And today we have with us Michael Anderson, senior researcher of Sightline Institute. Thank you for coming today and you know, sharing some insights. Maybe for people that aren't familiar, what is Sightline Institute? Maybe give a little background on what the organization does and okay, then we can kind of get into some specific topics that uh, you know, would be applicable to you know, our audience here. Sure. Sightline is a sustainability think tank for the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we were founded in 1993, okay. and uh, I think our niche in the environmentalism world is that, first of all, we really like cities. We think cities are essential to the future of the planet, the economy, the society, and we think that more people should get to live in cities if they want to. Okay. And uh, that's one of our program areas. And just generally speaking, I think we are sort of like a sustainability outfit that really thinks that economics is cool and can be put to good use in the service of the public interest. So we look at we look for ways to help do that. So one thing some members may know about is walk score. Yes. That came out of an idea from a sightline blog post in part many years ago from oh, my boss. So okay. that's the sort of thing that like we can make changes to the information that's available to the market and we can make sort of changes to the rules that shape the market in ways that benefit everybody. Gotcha. And what is your what's your background? I mean, is it is it on an, an economic side? Is it you know research? Maybe I'm a journalist by training, so I okay. uh, mostly I'm a communicator. I know about like how to make very complicated things only somewhat complicated. You know? Right. Right. Gotcha. Interesting. What? So let's talk a little bit about with the audience here, probably multifamily investors and owners within the Pacific Northwest. You know, I know there's been a lot of talk in in the metro area. There was a the RIP program, the residential info program what that means in terms of change of zoning. We've heard, you know, what, you know, I guess it was a Minneapolis that outlawed exclusive single family. Kind of what's your insight in that, that maybe people who haven't dug deep into this topic and kind of give this sense of what that means for a city, what that's going to do. You know, in our world, we're seeing, you know, construction kind of slow back down again. Uh, demand has continued. And, you know, how do we get this imbalance or fix this imbalance right. as we talk about affordability as well as, you know, not urban sprawl and things like that. So maybe give some insight on some of the things you guys have been doing lately and, you know, what you're finding. Sure. So one of the way to think about the residential infill project here in Portland is that the, um, I mean, it's basically, for the most part, giving people new options. It's not saying you have to do this or that, though the biggest thing that it changes is it shrinks the maximum size of the building you can build. Uh, that's the biggest thing it changes sort of you know, against what you're, towards what you're not allowed to do. In terms of what you are allowed to do, it says if you want to, you can put up to four kitchens in a building uh, Got it. and they can't stop you. So uh, same in Minneapolis, like uh, you can say that is making exclusive single family zoning illegal, or you can just say it's letting you decide to do what you want to do with your property up to whatever other constraints already existed. So um, one thing that I think is really great about this zoning reform uh, from an environmental perspective is that so many things we need to do to survive as a planet, to keep the planet habitable, require like cost and trade-off and like spending a little bit more for gasoline or whatever. Uh, with zoning, what we're doing is we're saying, no, you already want, if you already want to save energy by living closer to uh, your job or whatever, if you want to share a wall, like, you don't have to do that, but if you want to do that, hell yes, let's get out of your way, let's let you do that. And so the, getting it, uh, these zoning laws that were put in place in the mid-20th century out of the way of people to save their own carbon emissions if they want to, to live closer to each other in stronger communities in some cases, that we think that's all the good. So one of the misnomers, I think, for, you know, that I, we talk to people that are in, you know, single-family neighborhoods mm -hmm. is it's not – it's not restricting somebody coming in and you know doing a on a, a single family. It's just no. giving them options. They have other avenues they could look at for higher density, so to speak. That's right. Though one big exception to that is that when they set the new in Portland, the way it works is they set the new one unit maximum size at a smaller level. So it's up to 0 0.5 floor area ratio. Okay. And your folks know about that uh, on a standard R5 lot. Gotcha. Uh, and then it can be up to 0.6 for a duplex, up to 0.7 for a triplex or a fourplex. 
and up to 1.2 if you go for the affordable sixplex option. So that's where they're trying to incentivize more density by giving you more more coverage on that on that individual lot. Exactly. And the effect of that is not so much that it becomes really profitable to build a triplex or fourplex. It's that when you have a building at the end of its useful life, when you're looking at the numbers, it's probably going to make the most sense to put in the two or three or fourplex instead of the oneplex. And that's going to be better for everybody else in the city, and it'll be more or less the same for you. So you'll go for that. So in comparing, because I've, like I said, we've heard a lot about, you know, Minneapolis kind of doing this, I don't want to say doing it first, but was kind of out there. Is Are they in the similar program or were there different restrictions or more flexibility? Over there, there are different restrictions. And Minneapolis has noticed that when you make the rule, you don't have that sliding scale for the higher plexes. Almost nobody builds plexes. So in the first year, only three triplexes in the whole city of Minneapolis were built. You know, like they had the same signs, they had the same backlash, they had the same people saying this is going to destroy Minneapolis forever and all the south side of Minneapolis is going to be transformed completely. And what happened was absolutely nothing, virtually. Uh, the And, you know, there have been a few more permits since then, but like the big difference between Portland and Minneapolis is that in Portland we have set this sliding scale so you can get to a somewhat larger building size especially if you build the plexes. And it's not going to mean that Portland is going to transform either. It's also, right. our, the numbers we ran show that it's going to be very, very slow. But when a building gets to the end of its life, this is going to nudge you in the direction of building more small multifamily. And again, there was a lot of pushback from the neighborhood associations and the single family. I mean, in terms of thinking, oh my, I'm going to have a, you know, 20 unit built next to me, uh, you know, mid block or something. Maybe talk a little bit about you know, where that comes from, that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, whatever you want to say, and, and why that, you know, again, we've seen it in Minneapolis, which is a little bit ahead of us, mm -hmm. why that really isn't the case. Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing to understand is, like I said, it's not going to change everything overnight. Right. It totally makes sense. When I started looking into this, that's sort of what I thought, too. Uh, and then I just started looking at the numbers. And I realized, no, it just doesn't make economic sense to tear down a usable structure in almost any circumstance. So uh, that's one thing to know. Another thing is just generally, I totally get the idea that when you buy into a neighborhood, you expect it to remain more or less the same. Uh, one thing to think about is when we try to make rules to keep that expectation, sort of to fulfill that expectation that people naturally have, there's a question of like, what is it that we're trying to keep more or less the same? Are we trying to keep the structures right. more or less the same? Or are we trying to keep the character of the neighborhood, which to me means who gets to live in the neighborhood, what sorts of people you run into in the neighborhood, what your neighbors are like, how many kids are around, that sort of thing, more or less the same. And the, um, there's a trade-off because if you try to freeze the structures of the neighborhood in amber, we can see, you know, all the, everywhere down the California coast, you can see a bunch of neighborhoods that have done that and the people change because they're forced out of their homes by the fact that more people are competing for that limited number of structures. Right. And so uh, it's just a matter of us deciding as a society, which are the values that we're going to prioritize and how are we going to thread the needle? You know, there are some values on one side that are legitimate and values on the other side also legitimate. So uh, I think one good thing that this program does is it strikes a balance between uh, these neighborhoods are going to change gradually in a way that it hopefully helps the number of people in the neighborhood change less quickly than they have been. And in terms of, you know, and we've had, I've had this discussion multiple times with, you know, pe you know, clients and people that are even not in our industry is everybody talks about affordability, you know, especially here in the Northwest. Nobody wants urban, nobody wants expansion. I mean, we have an urban growth boundary. Mm -hmm. They want affordability, no, you know, no expansion or sprawl. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can't have, you can't have, and, and they don't want, too, right? and they don't want density in their neighborhood. Right, exactly. So I say, as I say to people, you know, you can't have, there's something there that's not going right. to, not going to work. We could be Houston, we could keep sprawling and exactly. it's affordable. We could be uh, Vancouver, BC, we could never build anything and be completely unaffordable. Right. Uh, not Vancouver build this, but not enough, obviously. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, so like, you have to choose your poison. Right, right. So are there, you know, is, are there cities that you've seen from a, let me say, zoning or kind of looking out as, hey, this is how we, we're going to have to change the fabric? Because, again, I, you know, I'm convinced even as we're coming out of COVID, I don't think cities are, are going to die. You know, yes, some people have gone out and moved to tertiary, but I, I think there's a reason why over history and both through mankind, you know, urban centers are continuing to get more populous. I mean, are there cities that have done this maybe, I don't say right, but maybe have looked at it more in depth and are working to that direction as opposed to, again, here in, you know, Oregon, Washington, California, where you have all this migration, there's this, this constant battle. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you look at when you're doing your research? Yeah. So my boss has actually been doing a series on exactly that 
problem, uh, that question of like what cities around the world have been coming up with good ideas. And there are lots of different good ways to do it. But uh, some of the ones we've identified in our articles on our website, uh, the uh, Paris is a great model of thinking regionally and sort of once you pull cities together into a, um, a shared compact, then not only do you have the motive to build enough housing, but you also have the means right. to build enough housing. You have a whole bunch of, of cities that are going to move together. And so like there's not a tragedy of the commons where if one city builds a lot of housing and another one doesn't, then it's still expensive. But like if everybody's moving forward, then you can make progress. Germany has a similar set of uh, incentives that sort of incentivize localities to want to grow. And so everybody's competing with each other to attract population because of the way their tax system is set up. And their, our, our tax system could change for the better in that way. In Tokyo, they've got a really standardized zoning system. So they've got national zoning in Japan. And uh, part of the result, there's just like nine zones in all of Japan. And uh, part of the effect of that is that it's a very standardized uh, set of building types that can pop up anywhere in Tokyo at any time. Uh, and Tokyo is like this massive city, obviously, that right. has actually been able to control its affordability price growth. Right. Yeah, that's right. So do you think, I mean, that's something we've talked about, you know, here before is, do you think eventually you'll see more of a national, I don't know, I don't know about nationalized, you know, zoning, but where you've got maybe it's federal or state saying, mm -hmm. look to these, you know, cities or, you know, even here with the neighborhoods, if you're not going to, you know, get on board in terms of more density, which will help affordability, mm -hmm. you know, this, we can't continue to go this way. You know, we've seen stories about, you know, Berkeley talks about they want to do affordable, but anytime somebody tries to build something, you know, nothing right. happens, and we've right. seen it here. I mean, do you think that's where this is going to go, or, where, you know, you guys look in your crystal ball? Yeah, I mean, we don't have crystal ball. I wish. Yeah. If, you, if you find one, let yeah, us know. Yeah, exactly. uh, the, um, but the, uh, I mean, there are a thousand different ways to ban housing, right? And you can ban it through the small size. You can ban it through requiring a lot of parking. You can ban it through uh, just saying you're not allowed to put more kitchens in the same lot. Uh, the... Um, Whatever the means are, it's my belief that for the same reason I was just talking about Paris, we should be having regional governments or states that are setting some basic standards for like, you can't be, you can't go below this bar, right? Like right. you have to do at least this well with what you're allowing. And if there's some empirical evidence that you're failing to do that, then there's going to be some sort of consequence. Uh, and uh, either you don't get a transportation funding for right. this or that or whatever. And... Um, I think that would create the possibility for collective action, for every city moving forward, not playing this, somebody else is going to solve this problem Kick, for the, us kick the can to the right. next neighborhood and let exactly. them deal with it. Yeah. And are you, you know, is, is being a think institute or, you know, think tank, is that, is that message getting through? Again, I don't expect it to get through to, you know, the single family homeowner, but more on a political side, is that coming through as – you know, look, if we don't have some collective, you know, working together regionally, you know, this affordability issue is not going to get to solve itself. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just you can't have every neighborhood kicking, right. you know, density to the next one. And it just goes around and around and around. Right. Exactly. Uh, and by the way, I would not say that, like, by no means is a majority, even of single family homeowners, I think, really right. agitated against this. I think it is a very vocal minority. And I think we saw that in the po political activity around this project in Portland. Uh who thinks that this is like a catastrophe. And there are a lot of people who think, yeah, it's sort of bad. And lots of people who think, yeah, it's sort of good. And then some people who are very passionate for it. I think the uh, general state of things and the diff challenge for a politician is to figure out what are the reasonable, politically viable things to do. So um, anyway, I wouldn't want to over represent that. There are a bunch of benefits to a property owner, obviously, of getting yeah. to do what you want on your property. Right. Um, uh, among them, ADUs are like extremely popular. And they're one of the things that is going to happen I think the most under these new rules is they've made the ADU rules a little bit more flexible. So you can put more prop, you can put a second ADU in your backyard, uh, and uh, and you leave your your own structure intact. I think as a result of some of that sort of mix of different positions, uh, I think politicians, especially in Oregon, but increasingly around the country, are coming to the view that yeah, we we can take action at the state level specifically, and set some more standards to try and end some of these shortages that the cities are failing to resolve. To address in terms of the density and yeah. you know, getting bringing more housing in. And it's not that cities are not trying or don't want to. It's that often they're not able to for various, you know, right. 
game theory sort of reasons, right? So like once we set those standards, I think that forces a conversation. So lots of cities, what we saw in Portland, for example, is that once the conversation was forced by the state and they could no longer just do nothing, pretend there was a perfect solution that was going to hurt nobody, then they were like, okay, well, what do we want? And they came up with this plan to do the sort of mixed income sixplex option. If, and that, is, that, that is, from my perspective, improved the plan quite a bit and it goes beyond the state's requirement, but it addressed the totally legitimate concerns of some people of what is this doing for regulated affordable housing? It's not right. just like a market rate affordable, but what about the like regulated affordable pricing? And okay, we can do that too. We can say you have the option to do that as well. And that wouldn't have happened if we had just been stuck in the Try not to hurt anybody. Let's not have any hard conversations. This isn't going to pay off for 20 years, so let's not, like, bother with it. Right. So, it's I, you know, I agree. It's, it is coming around. It's just, as you said, you can have a very vocal minority making a lot of noise, getting a lot of press. And, you know, is that really who you want deciding public policy? I mean, we right. see it in our in our world in the, Many you know, different the rental concepts. side from, you know, la, la, anyway, we want to get into that. So it's, it's interesting. What, I mean... In, from you, I mean, what else is you know your group looking at um, in terms of you know is it land use? Is it you know viability of cities? What are the other things kind of you're excited that you're gonna we're gonna see in the next couple you know in the next year or so? You guys kicking out reports on uh, the thing I'm really excited about right now is looking at the possibility for lowering parking mandates. So uh, parking like requiring a parking space for every unit for every job you create in an office building for like every customer in a retail m- yeah. Yeah, in a retail joint. Right. Uh, that's like going to happen for many, many years, but it shouldn't be mandatory. Like we shouldn't be saying either you create a job or you create a parking space. And in fact, we're going to require you to create the parking space. You cannot create that job unless you also create the parking right. space. That's a ridiculous rule. We should let it be the option of a site specific property owner to say, no, I, I do need this parking space. I'm happy to pay for it, set aside the space for it, but... Uh, let them have the let option to decide option. and, you, right, know, exactly. court, you know, take the risk or however you want to say it. That's right. um, and, and virtually every mun- municipality in the country and in, in the rich world has taken that option off the table. And as a result, we've basically ceased urbanifying, you know, we've ceased that long millennia long process you just described. Right. And we've done this suburban sprawl thing instead. And that's because we accidentally made it mandatory. Gotcha. And are you seeing that go away? I mean, are you? Is that getting uh, traction in in terms of? Yeah. Yeah. Losing that requirement. Like yeah, I said, a lot of, so I mean, but there was a bunch of progress. There was when the state passed a law on the plexes. They also built in the uh, sort of a limit on the number of parking spaces the city could require because that is, would have been a de facto way to just right. invalidate the bill. Right. And. Uh, in uh, sort of evolving out of that, I think the states and various cities, including Portland and Tigard and Bend, are all looking at reducing the number of parking spaces they're requiring, including to zero, as Portland has done essentially everywhere. Um, and that's not going to mean that nobody's ever going to build a parking space. It's just going to mean that we have the option to let the door open to entrepreneurs to do things like come up with a shared car for your apartment building. Like, that would be a way for to save everybody money. Right. Let's let, let them option. innovate as right. opposed to having to do it. They have a choice. Exactly. They can, yeah. yeah, yeah. Which is again a kind of on the on the rip program, residential info program. It, you're not forced to do it, but you have some options. Right. And right. What so just in terms of the kind of uh, what are you seeing with you know coming out of COVID? Hopefully, uh, you know the change in cities, so to speak. I mean, are you in the belief that you know this flight to suburbs and tertiary markets? It's going to come back. I mean, what's your kind of overriding thought on that? I really would love to know. I'm, so yeah. my, my sort of like tentative predictions for that are that I think there'll be a large minority of office jobs that permanently go uh, remote, and there'll be a larger minority, probably maybe even a majority, that go more remote. It's like several days a week, right? So kind of a hybrid. Right. right. So I think the effect of that is going to be less about choosing which cities people want to live in or which metro areas, more about choosing how long they're willing to tolerate a commute. So I do think there's going to be some more demand for living in larger spaces, probably in the burbs. Okay. Uh, but I don't think that's necessarily going to be that there aren't going to be jobs located in a central city. That's still going to be the most efficient place in a metro area to draw workers to. Right. And um, the uh, in terms of like what happens specifically to the burbs, uh, there's probably going to be continued inward outward flow of money over the decades. Right. But I would guess that in the short term. Uh, there will be more flow towards the burbs as a result of that. And as we do that, we should be sure that we are not making 
continued sprawl mandatory. We're letting the suburbs evolve in a natural way that helps the people who live there sort of decide their own destiny, not be forced and shambled on by the zombie laws of 100 years ago. Gotcha. Got it. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time to share some of these insights. Uh, for more information, you can go to the website below. And I'm sure we'll have you on again and talk a little bit more about, you know, from zoning to density to, you know, changes that we're seeing in the city. So thank you again for uh, joining us today. Been a pleasure. And we'll talk to you again on HFO TV. Thank you. Our entire office specializes in multifamily real estate, making HFO the largest multifamily brokerage in the Pacific Northwest. Your success is our passion. Build your legacy with HFO. Call 503-241-5541 or visit our website at hfore.com for more information.